Hi, this is Dr. Slater, Robert Slater, presenting a mock uh, lecture topic. Um, chiropractic management of a patient with non-traumatic acute lower back pain that radiates to the posterior thigh. This is a requirement for interview process being presented to uh, Dr. Hainline at the IMU. For the sake of brevity of the 20 minutes, all pertinent information will be presented on the video. The complete text is going to be is forwarded already to Dr. Hainline. So this is an introduction to the non-mechanical acute lower back pain without radiation to the posterior with radiation to the posterior thigh. Some general considerations regarding uh, this condition. It's more or less an epidemic in a lot of cultures, including the uh, uh, United States, particularly between the age of 30 to 50. Um, due to sedentary lifestyles, uh, people being on their feet a lot, people being uh, sitting down a lot, a lot of jobs with mechanical repetitive stress activity, and oftentimes the person's not exercising much to maintain their overall balanced um, spinal muscle integrity. Um, so a lot of postural compromise there, uh, lack of strength and coordination. Uh, in addition to that, there's always uh, the uh, possibility of unexpected uh, uh, stressful events going on like coughing and sneezing, bending, lifting, those sort of activities of daily lifting. And also people don't always uh, keep their vitamin and mineral levels up. So there's a tendency for ligament weakness or disc weakness. This is also part of it. So it is really a big problem. It's estimated that 28% of all people experience this condition sometimes during their lives. And it, it actually accounts for about 14% of the visits that um, come across the chiropractor's uh, attention. Uh, the condition is also remarkably responsive to uh, manipulation and or uh, nutritional intervention. Conservative management of such cases is appropriate for patients without prolonged severe pain, progressive neurological or myological deficits. There are categories of lower back pain as with associated pathophysiology that you want to work out before in the history and evidence gathering of information before you even touch a patient or consider uh, examining them. These are called red flags and um, the Classification of the red flag system is called I'm Fran, I M I apostrophe M Fran, F R A N. <clears throat> Category one, which is the I apostrophe M aspect, is cancer and metastasis. Common in people with age over 50, unexplained weight loss, or failure to respond to conservative care in four weeks. Category two is F. Uh, a recent non-traumatic stress fracture of the spine may be associated with a, a prolonged mineral deficiency, uh, osteoporosis, or people who have a medical history of corticosteroid use uh, for several years. They're very subject to minimal exertion, spontaneous spinal uh, stress fractures. Category 3, lower back pain secondary to inflammatory autoimmune arthropathies. There are many of those. And you can usually discover them in the, a, an astute um, history-taking process. <clears throat> Category four, uh, lower back pain, which is mimicked from ab abdominal disease, <coughs> excuse me, such as an abdo uh, abdominal aorta. Category five, lower back pain associated with neurological deficits in the connection with such conditions as a cauda equina syndrome. Again, uh, uh, careful questioning, careful uh, attention to detail during the exam will alert you to that red flag. All five of these red flag categories uh, <clears throat> need referral to a specialist and or uh, and hopefully uh, developing uh, an associated co-management plan with the chiropractor and the MD. Category six is lower back pain associated with relatively benign musculoskeletal stress. And that's going to contain the majority of patients coming into seeking our, our health care. Applying the I'm Fran modality will help you clarify and determine the category of lower back problems most closely defined or characterized by the patient's symptoms. So now we go to a comprehensive history. What's that purpose? You want to obtain a very appropriate history to uh, qualitatively assist in identifying the condition of the patient. 
um, as well as rule out significant risk complications that could interfere with the patient's treatment and recovery. So the twofold purpose of the examination, uh, that was the history, sorry, that was your purpose of the history. Then moving on to the examination uh, for a non-traumatic acute lower back pain uh, with radiation to the right posterior thigh, your purpose here is twofold. Uh, you want to identify the condition for what it is uh, reliably, and also f you want to succeed in not mistaking the condition for something else. And finally, you want to, uh, based on those two measures of uh, reliability and accuracy, um, generate an effective treatment plan for the patient which will get them through the problem. So the mock examination results we're going into now are associated with the patient assuming uh, standing position, sitting, supine, and prone. In the standing position, you would uh, first do the active range of motion in all quadrants. This assesses the integrity of the spinal muscular ligamentous structures at each motion segment. Then one might uh, progress to a squat and test, squat and rise test. This is a very, very reliable test. It assesses the integrity and, and uh, coordination of the uh, lumbar nerve roots to the muscles. The question is, is the patient able to squat symmetrically and fully and then rise without uh, distortion or weakness? The Trimbella, uh, Trimbellenberg test, uh, also uh, this is a, 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 an assessment of the pelvic girdle muscles um, complementary to the squat and rise test. Adequate strength, for example, of the right gluteus uh, medius muscle prevents the left hip or side of the pelvis from dropping during, uh, um, during right single leg stance. Next, you would want to go into the gait assessment. How is the patient walking? Are they able to walk in steady fashion? Um, how is the heel strike? Uh, they're not out of balance when one heel versus the other strikes. Do they... Are they comfortable and balanced when the foot is flat on the ground? And when they toe off, uh, when the toe is moving off from the single leg stance, is that a smooth, coordinated process? All functionings uh, associated here with the um, cerebellum and its uh, normal function. And lastly, is there reciprocal um, swing leg movements and arm movements during the swing leg portion of that? Just following through with the gait, uh, ask them to do a heel walk. This assesses the L5 nerve roots for irritation and uh, or, and or inflammation. <clears throat> it's sensitive to detect early dorsiflexion weakness associated with that. Uh, follow up by toe walk. That's your S1 nerve root uh, irritation assessment. The test is sensitive for early plantar flexion weakness. Very useful test. Uh, I keep on working in a standing position with uh, Gillet's marching test. It's a functional SI joint kinematic assessment test to determine as the patient as the patient is marching in place. Failure of the posterior superior iliac spine on the side tested to rotate posteriorly uh, on knee flexion or irregular superior migration of the same during knee flexion means motion dysfunction of the tested SI joint. So at this point in the um, examination, um, we've already considered a large portion of musculoskeletal conditions. Um, it's a very minimal um, set of tests to examine before you even examine or lay hands on the patient uh, to determine or qualify um, different types of uh, other neurological or orthopedic findings. It also builds confidence in the doctor-patient relationship because the patient's thinking, hmm, this is going pretty good. So lower motor reflexes would be the next um, in a sitting position. This just very quickly differentiates loader mo uh, a loader motor, lower motor pathology versus upper motor pathology versus cerebellar pathology. Uh, deep tendon reflexes. Uh, scoring is usually zero, no response, one diminished, two normal, three increase, and four hyporeflexia. Hyperreflexia. The deep tendon reflexes are L5 S1, that's over the median lateral hamstrings, patellar deep tendon reflex um, over the patellar ligament L3 and L4 spinal nerve roots, Achilles tendon reflex. Sorry, I lost my screen there. Um, 
this is your S1 spinal nerve. Hyperreflexia, again, suggests upper motor neuron lesion. Hyporeflexia suggests cerebellar pathology. Um, absent reflex with muscle with, with uh, muscle atrophy or random fasciculations suggests lower motor neuron uh, uh, abnormalities. Next, we will proceed to uh, lower limb muscle testing in the seated position. Test the muscle power for hip flexors, L1, L2 nerve roots, hip extension, L5, S1 nerve roots, knee flexion, S1 nerve root, knee extension, L3 and L4 nerve root, ankle dorsiflexion, L4 and L5 nerve roots, uh, plantar flexion, S1 and S2 nerve roots, toe flexion or forward, S1 and S2 nerve roots, uh, toe extension or backwards, L5, S1 nerve roots. Positive or abnormal findings or implications that would be weakness, loss of function, loss of sensation, hyporeflexia, hyperreflexia, as well as the radiation of pain and um, into some pattern associated with those. The grading of muscle strength would go zero, no movement, one, the flicker of an observed movement, two, movement with gravity eliminated, three, movement with uh, resistance eliminated, four, weak movement against resistance, and five, normal muscle power. From there, we would proceed to some orthopedic tests. Um, Babinski's <clears throat> you know, for pathological the world, for the pathological problems with the nerves. Uh, Babinski's is performed by stimulating the outside portion of the sole of the tested foot. It checks the S1 spinal nerve root for upper motor neuron lesions. Positive if when stroking the sole of the foot with a sharp instrument, there is an upgoing of the big toe and or flaring of the feet. Uh, again, um, cerebellar function test, heel to shin test, very easy to do, very uh, accurate and reliable in its assessment of the cerebellum. Um, ask the patient to place the heel on the um, of the right foot near the medial aspect of the left proximal shank. Repeat it three times to get a good idea of, of the overall result. Impaired coordination suggests contralateral cerebellar pathology. <clears throat> going to move through sensory testing kind of quickly here. Um, we're testing the first order and third, uh, first, second, and third order neurons of the anterior and lateral spinal thalamic tests with dermato dermo uh, dermatomal, uh, sensory testing, light touch testing, pain testing. The grading of sensory testing for light touch, uh, it goes intact, uh, zero is absent, one is impaired. Or hyperreflexia, hyperesthetic. Uh, two is intact. It, uh, skin dermatomes specifically affected by the ipsilateral peripheral single nerve root scenario of acute non-traumatic lower back pain with radiation are tested according to the following pattern: L3 uh, medial femoral condyle, L4 medial malleoli and distal medial shank, L5, dorsum of the foot at the L3 MIP joint, S1, lateral heel, S2, popliteal fossa in the midline. By definition, um, a pattern of limited dermatomal findings of any of those modalities, just limited to the posterior thigh, tend to rule out lesions of the anterior commissure of the spinal cord, ascending tracts of the spinal thalamic, or uh, a second order tracks. Assessment of the dorsal columns and medial lemniscus. This is your vibratory sense. It's conducted um, from the skin uh, through uh, mechanical receptors such as Pacinian corpuscles, uh, Merkel's disc, or tactile receptors. They send up an action potential to the cord and to the brain. Sensation of vibration, proprioception, fine touch, two point discrimination, travel to the postcentral gyrus of the parietal cortex um, via the ascending uh, dorsal columns of the spinal cord and then uh, in the brainstem, the medial lemniscus pathways. Damage to this system is called palesthesia. Uh, proprioception would be um, a very basic but essential test holding the uh, patient's big toe with one finger on the other side, asking them to demonstrate whether the toe is in neutral with their eyes closed flexed or extended. So moving to um, the anterior orthopedic screening test for uh, seated anterior. 
We, we would do a Digerings triad screening test. It's a simple increasing the pressure of the um, on the spinal cord by asking them to cough, sneeze, or strain as if they're going to have a bowel movement. Increase localized uh, pressure in the lower back uh, um, cerebrospinal fluid resulting in lower back pain or radicular pain. Um, it suggests a lesion, an encroachment, herniation, <clears throat> or sprain strain of the lumbar spine sacroiliac joints. Just following up in the seated position, um, a Bechterus test would be an appropriate one to follow. The patient is seated with flexion of the thoracic spine. Patient is then extends the knee on the tested side. First, the non-tested uh, sciatic nerve side or radicular side or painful side is tested, and they're both tested. And then both of them are brought up together. It's an excellent test, similar to the standing uh, t standard straight, straight leg raise. Um, however, this test also includes mild, mild spinal compression due to uh, forward flexion of the thoracic spine. Therefore, it might be a little bit more sensitive. Kemp's test, just following up in that seated position. This is used to determine uh, a diagnosis of localized facetogenic uh, local lumbar or sacroiliac joint, or nerve root irritation due to a discogenic source. For example, uh, if the patient is bent forward, leans to the right, and extends back on the right, uh, and they have um, the pain diminished, if it's radicular, if the, the uh, radicular signs diminish, uh, um, or sorry, if the radicular signs increase, that means that there's increased stress on a, a, a likely uh, lateral-sided lesion of the um, of the um, of the disc at L5. Uh, patient now goes to the supine position. Uh, we want to palpate the uh, abdomen to rule out any possibilities there of pathophysiology from the aorta. Um, looking for a re uh, rebound tenderness or guarding or palpation for any mask mass M A S S. Next, moving to the Faber-Patrick's test. It's an easy one to perform. Um, the doctor of chiropractic passively moves the thigh into flexion, abduction, external rotation while placing ipsilateral ankle on the contralateral knee. At the end of that movement, the doctor can stabilize the opposite uh, anterior superior uh, iliac spine while placing the mild downward pressure on the knee. And uh, if the SI joint in that case uh, is reported to be exacerbated, that's a positive test. That's a good one. The SI joint gapping or distraction test <clears throat> would follow uh, in a logical sense from that um, from that test. The SI joint distraction test in that the doctor applies downward posterior lateral force on the anterior iliac spine bilaterally and simultaneously for about 30 seconds uh, to gap the anterior aspect of the SI joint positive finding or a report of pain in that region suggests SI joint dysfunction due to sprain stain of the ligaments. There's a couple more tests here that um, I'll just mention in this, this position, Gainsland's and Thomas, they're also, they're also helpful in a, a, a assessing lower back, all three of those, lower back versus hip uh, versus uh, muscle spasm of the iliopsoas. Uh, just skipping to the straight leg test, possibly raise the leg while the patient is supine. It's a very, it's an especially reliable test for disc herniation. If the patient experiences um, a pain or radicular pain um, below 45 degrees, uh, anything above that is less and less diagnostic value. Also, in that uh, that context, there uh, there's Yeoman's test, there's Hibbs test which I won't go into any detail. They also give a helpful information indicating uh, localized SI joint pathology, um, either anterior, posterior, and help differentiate between uh, lumbar spine and hip pain, whichever is reported in those two tests. <clears throat> so um, a mock review here of clinical and examination review for this patient would be uh, history, acute exacerbation onset, um, sensory deficits, none. Weakness, none. Normal reflexes. Radiation. Mm. 
Sorry, lost my screen again. Apologize. Um, radiation to pain generally doesn't extend below the knee. Um, more often to the buttocks, posterior thigh. <clears throat> but it does re represent a complication. Orthopedic assessment, uh, just summing it up. If three or more provocative orthopedic tests are positive, the average of their estimates when their combined sens specificity and uh, sensitivity and specificity are evaluated usually leads to a fairly reliable diagnosis. Bechterus test, sensitivity 95, specificity 40. Kemp's test, sensitivity 86, specificity 67. Faber's test, sensitivity 89, specificity uh, 89. SI joint gapping test, sensitive 60, uh, sensitivity 60%, specificity 89. Uh, straight leg raise, sensitive 95, specificity 40. Yeoman's test, sensitivity 80, specificity 80. Gibbs test, sensitivity 60, and specificity 55. So the average here, the average sensitivity and specificity, uh, 81 versus 66, all tests combined, um, would allow us to um, accurately and uh, correctly diagnose the patient's symptoms for what they are 81% of the time, as well as um, in 66% 6 of the cases, um, not mistake that for something else. So um, case assessment and diagnosis, um, basically that was summarized in the previous section. I won't go into that. We will come up with a diagnosis uh, for him, a tentative diagnosis. Um, Moderate sprain strain of the lumbosacral and or sacroiliac joints associated with moderate paraspinal spasm strain of the facet irritation. Possibility of a mild disc injury, uh, inflammation, um, with posterior lateral herniation uh, and non-thecal impingement. Complications would be sclerotogenous non-sciatic radiation of the pain to the posterior thigh. Um, treatment management, uh, treatment plan, clinical management and treatment. Treatment can now confidently be, be begun because we've excluded um, uh, pain generators associated with possible underlying pathophysiology, infection, osteoporosis, stress fractures, or osteomyelitis. And we go ahead and explain that diagnosis to the patient, uh, ask her any questions about their, um, about their findings, and then go ahead and get consent to treat them. Treatment plan would run something along the lines of Seeing them two to three times a week for one to two weeks, then uh, two times a week for two to three weeks. The patient, in all probability, would require additional treatment following the completion of the initial treatment plan. And that treatment plan would involve um, take-home instructions, ice pack, mild exercising, stretching. You want to establish, establish with the patient um, some very active professional goals. Um, they want to know and understand what to expect from their treatment. Um, explaining the rationale and therapeutic modalities, options, and instructions. Um, for example, rest, electrical muscle stimulation, mechanical traction, myofascial release, massage, spinal manipulation, exercise, or, or any type of orthotic support, soft tissue lumbar support. Um, uh, prognosis, also explain that to the patient. They, they want to feel confident in your hands and they're going to get good results. So your medical forecast explain is uh, for the majority of patients I I've seen over the years um, with your condition, acute lower back pain uh, with radiation just to the posterior thigh, uh, you can be uh, very confident in re um, returning to an improvement of at least uh, 10 to 15, maybe more percent within the first four weeks of your treatment. Uh, if the patient doesn't respond, uh, advise them that do referral will take place with associated medical uh, Im imaging. So that summarizes my uh, presentation on this. Thank you very much for your attention.